I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm going to say it now. I really like WWE doing their pay-per-views on Saturday. And in particular, I like when they go international with these pay-per-views. They start earlier in the day here, so I'm not as gassed after watching it. And the crowds are much hotter than kind of the spoiled, entitled, uh, regular American crowds. They really are. The London crowd for Money in the Bank was as fantastic as you would expect them to be for this show. And that absolutely helps the viewing experience, especially when you're watching at home and having to watch on shit-ass Peacock. I understand WWE made a lot of money with that deal, but from a user experience standpoint, Peacock is the absolute drizzling shits. The live stream experience sucks. You can't even go back while you're watching it live. That's fucking dumb. How in the hell was it so inferior to the WWE Network on so many levels? The live watching sucks. The, hey, if you're not a Premium Plus subscriber, instead of getting the fucking match vi vi hype video, here's some crappy fucking commercials. To the significantly reduced catalog available, fuck Peacock. But the London crowd helps me forget that I'm watching it on a third-rate streaming service. Anyways, this show kicked off with one of the Money in the Bank ladder matches. One sure if it was going to be the men's or women's. I re haven't really been paying much attention. It was the men's. And Ricochet, I thought, did a good job of kind of filling that traditional Shelton Benjamin oh shit moment in a ladder match spot. He did good there. Um, that one spot with Logan Paul could have really went wrong and looked like it almost did, but they got through it. Here, here's, here's the observation. I thought this match was kind of, uh? And the winner was really, uh. And I know Damian Priest has put in some work. He's in a featured spot on Raw. The company's behind him. But yeah, to me, it's like, LA Knight is so massively over, but you could make the argument is he doesn't need it right now. You could have him be the Royal Rumble winner. You could do that with LA Knight. And then you have Logan Paul. And it's like, yeah, there's a star. It's something different. There's history there with him and Seth Rollins. This could absolutely fucking work. And they went with Damian Priest instead. And it was just kind of a... I'm sorry, it was. I understand, like, they're behind him. He did his thing with Bad Bunny in Puerto Rico. Fine. But, to me, you had two obvious options. Logan Paul, LA Knight, WWE, showing that they will go whatever the fuck direction they want to go still. Doesn't matter whether it's Big Nose God or the creator Vince McMahon himself. They will do whatever the fuck they want the hell with what anybody else thinks. And you could just sense it from the crowd. It was kind of... Ugh. WWE is really good at the uh, finish, you know what I mean? Uh, women's Tag Team Championship. Obviously, the notable thing here is Shayna Baszler turning on Ronda Rousey mid-match. And, you know, as I watch it, Ronda Rousey, again, it just reminds me of, like, she started off with a ton of momentum at the very beginning and quickly fell off to the point where she's just another woman on that roster. Liv Morgan, Raquel Rodriguez are new Women's Tag Team Champions, and that's all about all the hell anybody cares about it. Intercontinental Championship, Matt Riddle versus Gunther. And I'm sorry, Matt Riddle sucks. He always sucks. He still sucks. He always will fucking suck. From his punchable face to the dipshit looks he has, to the stupid barefoot ass, his style, his selling, every fucking thing about him just grates me from a personality and personal standpoint. I can't understand for the life of me why anybody would fucking think that this guy is any goddamn good. At least with Gunther, I can say, you can take him seriously. He comes across as serious. Right? This match was kind of, eh? Obviously, the much bigger thing is Drew McIntyre making his appearance there in London. Drew McIntyre is back. And of course, he's going after a mid-card title. So it seems like we're heading towards him and Gunther at Sl SummerSlam and sign me up for that just perfectly fine. Cody Rhodes should be thankful, number one. 
that he could beat the Cena allegations at least for one night since he didn't main event. Even though the reports yet started to come out yesterday that that match was going to main event. That would have been a fucking shit show. How stupid would that be? But we should be thankful too he had Dominic Mysterio to carry him in this match. And you're going to say, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean Dominic Mysterio could actually get some legitimate heat which is what Cody Rhodes needs for the Cody Rhodes character to kind of work. And it's fascinating to me as I watch Cody Rhodes and his entrance and Seth Rollins and his entrance. One observation I had during this show on Twitter, and it actually worked for me, believe it or not, is how much fans really have dove headfirst in to getting outrageously excited about mid-ass entrance music because the talents are so mid-ass at best. Fans are clearly trying to compensate. The match here was okay. Rhea Ripley looked fantastic. It was solid. Cody Rhodes wins. Not that big of a deal. You did get one real massive surprise on this show, and it was John Cena. <laughs> clearly he hasn't hit the tanning booth. He, he got himself into London shape by saying, give me the even paler fucking look. But as Grayson Waller comes out and interrupts him and they have their back and forth, you know, Cena's sitting there trying to talk about WrestleMania in London and maybe they're going to do WrestleMania 41 in London. I don't know. To me, I wish it would be 40 because you got to say America can't handle it. The real reason Cena should have appeared was to issue the challenge right here, right now to Randall Keith Thornton. One-on-one, -on -one, WrestleMania 40, night one main event. This time it counts. A career-ending match. Because how the fuck can you follow that up? But as I watched Grayson Waller come out, combined with the fact that Austin Theory once again wasn't on the pay-per-view, I sat there and I was thinking to myself, Grayson Waller is what Aust the company wants Austin Theory to be, specifically Vince. Like, Grayson Waller should have gotten that spot, not Austin fucking Theory. Am I wrong here? And I'm am I wrong? I don't know that this made me want to see a Cena versus Grayson Waller match because I'm all in on John Cena and Randy Orton one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania 40. It's the only fucking match in the world that matters to me right now. This time it counts, though, damn it. But if you're going to say, hey, he's got a match he's going to have at some point with Grayson Waller, so be it. But it was a nice surprise for the crowd, whatever. For one night, we can pretend that John Cena doesn't totally fucking suck and hasn't always fucking sucked, even though he always fucking has, for the most part. Uh, the women's Money in the Bank ladder match I actually enjoyed more. And maybe that's because Trish was in it. I mean, she's fucking in her mid-40s. She's so fucking bagging. I don't give a shit what anybody says. Um, I was surprised and a little bit, eh, underwhelmed by EO Sky winning. But whatever, I understand why they went there. But I thought, personally, this women's match was better than the men's match. And you're going to say, well, it's a sloppier. Of course, most fucking women's matches in WWE are sloppy as shit. That doesn't stop a lot of you from pretending like Charlotte Flair's fucking great, even though she is just a botchy bitch, and there's a big difference, believe me, between sloppy and botchy. She's fucking both. Uh, but the handcuff spot was pretty well done. I was a little surprised that either Becky or Trish didn't win here, but it is what it is. It's a match I don't care, won't ultimately care about or remember down the line. It is what it is. The World Heavyweight Championship... Between Seth Rollins and Finn Balor, see my previous statements about mid-ass entrance music and the fans going ape shit for it because the town is just... <sighs> this match was okay. I was wondering, hey, if you're going to throw out a real curveball, you went there with Damian Priest winning Money in the Bank. Why, is he going to cash in? Like, what are the odds of that? And obviously he came out during this match um, and ended up costing Finn. It's just, okay, whatever. You know, maybe you could have said, hey, it would have helped Finn, and then he could have cashed in on Finn. That would have made things interesting for SummerSlam and the Judgment Day. Or he just came in and cashed in and walked out the champ, made things interesting for SummerSlam. I don't know, just kind of that. Eh. Like, this was an okay match, and that's it. That's all it really was. But again, like, everything was pointing towards the match that mattered the most on this night. That main event, and it freaking should have. The Bloodline Civil War. And this match was great. And of course, leave it to that ungrateful ass, no good turncoat, Jey Uso, to deploy a deliberate low blow to our tribal chief because he knows he can't beat him straight up one-on-one. -on -one. 
And he's going to find it out the hard way at fucking SummerSlam. Go tiptoeing through the tulips. God damn it, Roman Reigns is going to help you smell the motherfucking roses. But there's one kind of gripe I have with this. Is should Roman have gotten pinned here? They kept mentioning, you know, it, last time Roman was pinned or submitted was December of 2019. And now you're doing it three and a half years later in a tag match with no titles on the line. Like if you told me, hey, you give Jay this moment here and then he loses to Roman at SummerSlam and then you go on another 12 plus months with Roman as champion. I'm like, okay, you allow enough distance to where you say this is the one person that beat him, but it's so infrequent. And it happened so long ago, it doesn't really matter. I also can understand the storytelling element that you've planted here. Like, storytelling-wise, it does make sense. Especially if Jay is going to be that opponent for the title at SummerSlam. He can say that he's pinned the Tribal Chief. It does make for an interesting, captivating story. And they'll make this work. But I just sit there and say, did you have to pin Roman here? Was that really the right call? Like, if you have somebody pin Roman for the belt in the next few months, does that in any way diminish it because you just recently saw somebody else do it in a fuck-away tag match? I don't know. You guys tell me. And if you say, yeah, it was stupid, they shouldn't have done it, I agree. If you say, no, what you talked about with the story and how it ties in and how it makes sense, I could also agree. I was just, I was somewhat surprised that they did it, but maybe not entirely. I don't know. Um, but it was a really, really good main event. It really was. But Jay will get his fucking comeuppance. It's always got to be goddamn Jay Uso. He's been the biggest thorn in the side and pain in the ass to the Tribal Chiefs since day one. Speaking of day one-ish. That's day one-ish right there. Overall, it was an okay show. I feel like I've seen a couple of better events from WWE this year. The Puerto Rico show I thought was better than this one, for example. It was okay. I was underwhelmed by the Money in the Bank winners. You know, the main event was really, really good. Most of the rest of this card, though, I just felt was kind of like, eh, matches. Crowd was great. Environment was great. But it was just solid. And not every show is going to be fantastic or bang up. It was solid. And I guess, compared to what I've seen out of WWE over the years, if a solid show feels like a disappointment, then it's in, they're in a pretty good spot right now. 